we know from chapter 3 how we can take an ordinary language sentence that involves connectives and translate that into symbolic logic notation. In addition, we know what a truth table is and we know how to use it. In other words, we know what the truth definitions are for each of our connectives and we know how to generate truth tables so that we can see the possible truth values of individual sentences as well as whether or not two sentences are truth functionally equivalent. Now we're going to dig a bit deeper into the logic of Boolean connectives by talking about uh, truth. More specifically, we're going to talk about how we can understand truth in terms of tautologies, logical truths, and Tarski's world necessities. We're also going to revisit the concept of validity, that is, logical consequence, in terms of truth table consequence or tautological consequence. Let's get started. So this slide involves uh, a text version of what I just said uh, in the voiceover uh, for the previous slide. So if you want to pause and read it, go ahead. Otherwise, let's keep going. In order to help us understand the concept of logical necessity, let's first revisit a concept that we already know, uh, namely logical possibility. We know, for example, that it is not physically possible for us to flap our arms and fly like a bird. We can, however, think about it. So now let's consider Tursky's world. Remember, the constraints of Tarski's world make it impossible for us to build a rectangle. No such objects exist in Tarski's world. It is, however, logically possible for us to think about doing this. We could create a sentence, for example, A is a rectangle, and we could notate that, sen that sentence in terms of the symbolic logic notation that we've learned. We can also create compound sentences by way of multiple atomic sentences, well, at least one atomic sentence, and one or more Boolean connectives. So we get the sentence, A is a rectangle, but B is not. So there are logically possible sentences that are not physically possible, or possible in Tarski's world. We know that every Tarski's world sentence is logically possible, that is, any sentence that we can build, for which we can build a world, I should say, is a sentence that is Tarski's world possible. A truth table possible sentence, that is a logically possible truth functional sentence, is one that is true on at least one row of the truth table. Now remember, if you've got a compound sentence that involves multiple operators, only one of those operators is the main operator, that is, is the one that governs the sentence. It is the values in the column uh, on every row in the column under that connective that we look at to determine truth table possibility. All right, so we know uh, what it means to say that a sentence is logically possible. We can talk about logical possibility in terms of uh, Tarski's world in terms of a truth table. So we've got a foundation for understanding the uh, concept of a tautology and the concept uh, more broadly of logical truth. A logically true sentence is one that can never be false. It is a necessarily true sentence. Oftentimes a logically true sentence is called a logical necessity. We can see that a logically true sentence is one that is a logical consequence of any premises. In other words, remember that a sentence is a logical consequence of another or other sentences when it's impossible for that sentence to be false when the other or others are true. Suppose, though, that that sentence is true regardless of whether or not any other sentences are true. In other words, suppose that we either have an argument that has uh, sentences that are false or that have sentences that are true, 
the logically necessary sentence is one that is true irrespective of the truth values of other sentences. Think about identity statements. These are statements that can never be false. It is impossible, based on the meaning of identity, for an object not to be identical to itself. So regardless of whatever else is going on, what, regardless of the, the uh, truth values of other sentences, an identity sentence is always true. Consider every possible world. For ease of thinking about this, make it every possible Tarski's world. A sentence that can't ever be false in every possible world is a sentence that must always be true in it. Now, when we talk about a tautology, we're talking about a sentence that is always true by virtue of their truth functionality. In other words, they are always true in the truth table, on every row of the truth table in the column under the main connective. We'll see that all tautologies are logical truths or logical necessities, but not all logical truths are tautologies. After all, not all logical truths can be demonstrated by the truth table method, as in the sentence A is identical to A. Remember that Boole thinks only, if you will, of a sentence in terms of its possibility as true or its possibility as false. So the sentence A is identical to A in a truth table is just an atomic sentence that's either true or false. The meaning of identity is not taken into consideration by the truth table. Okay, so let's take a look at, if you will, the increasing breadth of uh, necessity. We have tautologies, that is, truth functionally true sentences. We have analytical truths, that is, logical necessities. And we have Tarski's world necessities. So a sentence that is a tautology is always true in virtue of the truth definitions of the connectives and the truth values, possible truth values of the atomic sentences that constitute or contribute to the sentence as a whole. An analytical truth or logical necessity is a truth that is based on the meanings of the first order logic language. So we have, for example, the sentence, or sorry, we have, for example, uh, the principle of identity, which is expressed by the sentence A is identical to A. That is, a sentence is a, or a, an object, I should say, is identical to itself and not to anything else. It is what it is and not something else. And then lastly, a sentence must be true in Tarski's world based on what Tarski's world allows. In other words, A has to be, if A exists, if we give an object a name A, it must be a tet or a cube or a dodec. That's because tets, cubes, and dodecs are the only possible shapes. Now let's take a look at how we construct a truth table when we're dealing with multiple atomic sentences. So we know already from chapter uh, 3 that when we have one atomic sentence, we have two possible truth values, that is, two lines in the truth table. When we have two atomic sentences, we have four possible truth values for each of the atomic sentences. Notice that this, the number of rows, rather, increases exponentially with the number of atomic statements. So the number of lines is determined by 2 to the number of atomic sentences, or 2 exponent number of atomic sentences. Now let's talk about how we determine the truth value of a compound sentence that has or that is constituted uh, by in addition to the atomic sentences that are involved in it uh, multiple connectives. So recall that we talked about in chapter 3 how you identify 
the main connective in a compound sentence that involves multiple connectives. The main connective is never going to be in a parenthetical. The main connective is the connective that applies to every element in the sentence. So let's take the example under the second bullet point. It is the disjunction that brings together the atomic sentence A and the atomic, or sorry, the atomic sentence A and the sentence not both C and D. If you eliminate the atomic sentence A and you eliminate the disjunction, you then have the sentence not both C and D, which would make the negation the main connective. The conjunction is in the parenthetical, so it can't be the main connective. Another way to think about it is that the conjunction applies to C and D, whereas the negation applies to the, the conjunction, and C and D is a conjunction sentence. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose we have three sentences, A, B, and C. That means we will end up with eight rows of possible values. If you use the uh, autofill, you'll see the following, namely that whichever is the first sentence, that is the sentence on the leftmost side, is going to take half values of true, half values of false. The next sentence to its right will take half of the true values from the reference column under A and alternate in pairs, true, false, and then half of the false values from the first sentence and alternate again in pairs, true, false. However many atomic sentences you have, it's going to be the case that the last atomic sentence, that is the sentence on the far right of the, in the reference sentence pane, is going to take alternating TF, TF, TF. Now, why do we have eight rows? Well, that's because the number of rows in a truth table is determined by the following formula. The number of rows or number of lines equals two to the power of, or two to the number of atomic sentences. In this case, two to the third power. So two times two times two. Now notice that we have four atomic sentences. So that means the number of rows that we will have in our truth table for the reference columns, as well as, of course, the statement for which we want to determine truth values, will be determined by two to the fourth power, or two times two times two times two, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 2 is 16. And remember, we always begin with half true, half false. So we've got 16 rows, half of those for the first sentence in the reference column will be true, the other half will be false. And then we take half of those first 16 so that we have four true, four false, four true, four false for the second reference column, and so on until we get to the last sentence, the last atomic sentence, D, which will alternate true, false, true, false. So here's how it works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Right? Four atomic sentences, 16 rows of the truth table. Now we're going to take half of that first set of values. So we're going to see the first eight rows be applied as follows under the reference column for B. So there are eight trues. Now under B, there will be four. One, two, three, four, and then four false. One, two, three, four, and again. One, two, three, four trues. One, two, three, four falses. 
Now under the uh, atomic sentence C, we take half of the first set of trues under B as our guide to determining the number of T's for C. So we get two trues, two false. Two trues, two false. Two trues, two false. Two trues, two false. And then as I mentioned, D alternates all the way down. True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, and so forth until we get to the last uh, row. So what we have now is a complete set of possible values. In other words, these are all the possible permutations of T's and F's, the combinations that are possible for these four sentences. Now we're in a position to uh, generate the truth values for the sentence, it's neither A nor B, but it's C or D. So if we are not sure what the main connective is, Boole helps us. So suppose we think the main connective is this negation. Notice that when we click on uh, this sentence, uh, sorry, rephrase, when we click on this operator, we're told to use the values under disjunction. If we think that the disjunction is the main operator, we're told that we need to use the values under the reference column for respectively A and B. If we think the main operator is this disjunction, the second disjunction, notice that we're told to use the values under the uh, atomic reference, uh, atomic sentence references C and D. Remember too that the main connective, the main operator, is never a parenthetical. It's never inside a pair of parentheses. Remember the main connective is the one that governs the sentence as a whole. The only connective that brings together all of the elements is the conjunction. Right? The conjunction brings together the negated disjunction on one side and the disjunction on the other. Now, uh, it doesn't matter if we start with the left side or the right side. We will determine the values of conjunction last. It does matter, however, on the left side of the conjunction, which we calculate first. Right? So again, if we're thinking only of the sentence negation parenthesis A, disjunction B, close parenthesis, we can see that the disjunction is, is the sub operator. Um, and that's because it's in the parentheses. In addition, it is the negation that rejects the disjunction. And so it is the negation that's the main operator. Let's take our truth definitions for disjunction and apply them all the way down. A disjunction is false when and only when each of the disjuncts is false. So we have the following values. True, 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 false, 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 false. Now we move on to reject the values under the disjunction. So it's not the case that true. False, 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 all the way down until the value of the disjunction is false. Then the negation is true, 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 true. Now let's move on to the disjunction. Here again, we're going to apply our truth definition of the disjunction. That in this case, we're using the atomic sentences C and D. So we have true, 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 false, true, 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 false, true, 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 false. And then lastly, we're looking at the values on each side of the conjunction. We know that the conjunction is true when 
and only when each of the conjuncts is true. So we have the following values. False, 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 all the way down until we have uh, values that are uh, both true. Okay, let's pause for a moment, make sure that everything uh, looks good, and then let's look at a feature of bool that will tell us whether or not we've got things right. Okay, so if we want to know whether or not we have determined the truth values correctly, we've got a button that will allow us uh, to verify whether or not the determinations are accurate. Now notice the X on line four. Now um, what is being, what's highlighted, that is the uh, T under the disjunction and the F uh, under the negation uh, is a bit confusing. It, it actually distracts you from the real problem. Uh, at least the X tells you that there is an issue. So uh, I confess that I'm not sure why um, Bool is highlighting these two um, values, that is specifically the values under these two operators, the error is actually over here, right? So on row number four of this disjunction, we see that C and D are both false, which makes the disjunction false, right? So I'm not quite sure I confess why the those were highlighted, but the good news is if you're not sure that things have gone well, in other words, if you're not sure that you've done things right, you can use the verify feature to determine, um, what, to at least tell you if there's an issue. So once I fix the error, now, hello, everything looks wonderful. We get all green check marks. Okay, so um, this is just one example of how you can, um, um, uh, uh, one sentence, um, which serves as an example of constructing a truth table. Uh, what I will also point out um, later is how we can uh, assess the sentence, but for right now, just know that the sentence is uh, contingently true. That is, the sentence is a truth table possible sentence. It's true on at least one row of the truth table. Now let's go back to the uh, first sentence that I showed you when I used autofill to fill in the reference values. Um, this one should look a lot easier now, right? Because it's only eight rows, not 16. Um, it's, it's considerably easier to, to cope with. At least it's less tedious. So here again, we want to make sure we're comfortable with uh, what the main operator is and the order of operations. So the main operator is not the disjunction. That's because the negation is rejecting the disjunction. And we can tell that the negation rejects the disjunction because the parentheses around the disjunction tell us that this compound sentence is to be treated as a unit. It is the conjunction that generates a connection between, respectively, the negated sentence and the atomic sentence C. So um, we are going to... Um, uh, generate our uh, values by way of the disjunction first. So we already know what the truth definitions uh, are for a disjunction and our shortcut is that a disjunction is false in one and one case only. That is when and only when each of the disjuncts is false. So we have the following. True, 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 false, false. Again, it's nice that Bool highlights our reference. In this case, the two atomic sentences under the reference uh, uh, referent columns. Now we're going to reject all of the values under the disjunction. Again, when we put our uh, cursor under the uh, negation, the uh, sentence we are to negate is highlighted. So we have false, 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 all the way down until the last two rows. And then lastly, the conjunction is going to be determined by the values under the negation and the atomic sentence C. So C is not uh, being 
uh, it has not been uh, rejected. There's nothing to do to the C uh, except by way of the conjunction. So we're saying the following, C is true, but the conjunction is true when and only when each of the conjuncts is true. And so even though C is true, the negation is false. Hence, the conjunction is false. And all the way down to row seven, and then row eight is false. Let's check to make sure that the uh, determinations are correct. We get all check marks, which is great. Now, if you click on the assessment button, you'll have several possibilities. Notice that there are some grayed out um, options and they're grayed out because they are available to us only when we are assessing multiple sentences. Either we're classifying them as uh, equivalent or we are classifying them as, uh, or sorry, we're classifying one of the sentence, uh, one of the sentences as um, a consequence of the others or not. So don't worry about uh, tautology at the moment. Don't worry about uh, contradictoriness at the moment. This sentence is truth table possible. Why? Because this sentence is true on at least one row. Another way to put it, put it is that it's contingently true. Let's check our classification and we're correct. Now let's briefly talk about what it means uh, to say that sentences are equivalent. We already know what logical equivalence is by way of the truth table notion of equivalence. That is, two sentences or t even more are truth functionally equivalent when they have the same value on every row in the columns under the respective main connectives. We also know that we get logical equivalence when we understand the meanings of certain predicates. So for example, left of, right of. You can see in the examples under the second bullet point the De Morgan's equivalences that we discussed in chapter three. Now let's return to another concept with which you're already familiar and see how it plays out via a truth table. We know that an argument is valid when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. In other words, the con conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. How does this play out in a truth table? Well, what we do is we construct a truth table that consists of the number of premises in an argument as well as the conclusion. When we've completed the truth table, we look at each row. Specifically, we look at the column under the main connective for each of the premises and the conclusion on the assumption that there are connectives involved in each. And if there aren't connectives involved in each, then we will have at least one atomic sentence, but it doesn't matter because it's still going to be the case that we look at the values on every row, whether the sentence is atomic or compound. If the latter, we look at the column under the main connective. If it's the case that there is no row on which the conclusion is false while the premises are true simultaneously, right, each row, then the argument is valid. Then, in other words, the conclusion is a tautological consequence of the premises. Let's take a look at how this plays out. All right, so uh, take a look at the example at the top. Notice that we have the following three sentences, not both A and B, it's not the case that not A, and not B. Let's say that from left to right, the first two sentences are the premises, and the last sentence on the right is the conclusion. In other words, the premises are not both A and B, and it's not the case that not A. The conclusion is not B. On the assumption that you have looked at how you construct a truth table, going back to chapter three, 
the uh, what I have here should be clear. In other words, going left to right, the negation is the main connective in the sentence, not both A and B. So the uh, values under the conjunction have already been determined and then negated by the operator uh, hook so that we end up with the values false, true, true, true. In the second premise, not, not A, we've already calculated out from the first negation, negated the values under A, the second negation, the one on the left in that sentence, which is a rejection of the negation next to A. So A was respectively true, true, false, false, a becomes false, false, true, true, so that not, not A becomes true, true, false, false. Lastly, not B's values are false, true, false, true. Now don't get lulled into thinking that this argument is valid because there is one row where the premises and the conclusion are all true at the same time. That's row two. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So on row two, the conclusion is true and both the premises are true. And one might say, ah, that's why the argument is valid. That's not the case. Remember, an argument is valid when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false while the premises are true. So what we need to look at are the rows on which the conclusion is false and then look to see if both premises are true. So row number one, the conclusion is false, and the second premise is true, but the first premise is false. Row number three, the conclusion is false, but so also is the second premise. So you see, it's not the case that there is a row on which the premises are true while the conclusion is false. Hence, the third sentence, not B, is a truth functional or tautological consequence of the sentences not both A and B and not not A. Now take a look at the bottom two examples. The uh, sentences that you see are in the blocks language and uh, we also have the identity symbol which is part of our first order logic language. In the first example, A is larger than B, B is larger than C, therefore A is larger than C. If we construct a truth table, we'll find that in fact, truth functionally, this argument doesn't work. It's not the case that the third sentence is a truth functional consequence of the first two. But we know the argument is valid. It is the case that the first two sentences guarantee the third by virtue of the predicate larger than, or sorry, yeah, the predicate larger, the relation larger than, and the arrangement of the individual constants. Similarly, we can come up with a row on which the uh, first two sentences in the second example are true while the uh, third sentence is false. And so we would say, oh, truth functionally, the sentence A is identical to C doesn't follow from the sentences A is identical to B and B is identical to C. But the third sentence is a logical consequence of the first two. We know this because the identity symbol tells us that if it's the case that A is the same one and the same as B, that is A is identical to B, and that B is one and the same as C, by the transitivity of identity, A is identical to C. So I hope that you can see that a truth table is not going to give us all the information we, we need uh, depending on what sort of sentence we're using. Remember, the truth table is effectively an algorithm for our atomic sentences in combination with the meanings of the uh, connectives, that is, the truth definitions of our operators.
So you can see now, if we take a look at Fitch and we look at the, um, the rule, uh, rules menu, that we have uh, possible logical consequences. We can talk about a logical consequence in terms of an analytical consequence, a logical consequence in terms of a tautological or truth functional consequence, and a consequence in terms of first order consequence. So take a look at this slide and see if what you're reading makes sense given what we've discussed so far. Now let's take a look at Fitch itself so that you can see these ideas play out. Okay, so here we have the last example from the slide we just looked at. A is identical to B is the first premise. B is identical to C is the second premise. And the inference is at number three, A is identical to C. Now if I highlight lines one and two, I'm saying that line three is an inference from these two lines, lines one and two. So I've cited lines one and two. Now if I go over to the rule menu and I scroll down to the con options, I have the following, anacon, focon, and totcon. Now I told you just a little bit ago that this argument is not going to come out correctly in terms of its being the case that sentence three is a tautological consequence of the first two. That's because it's not a tautological consequence of the first two. The identity symbol is not a truth functional symbol. What we have here as far as Boole is concerned, as far as a truth table is concerned, is uh, three atomic sentences. So if I click on TOTCON and I go to check my answer, I will get an X. On the other hand, if I say that this is an FOCON or a first order consequence, and by this I mean sentence three, right? So if I say sentence three is a first order consequence of sentences one and two, and I check that, I get a check mark. It's the same with ANACON. So ANACON, recall from chapter two, is the broadest uh, notion of validity. Right, so anacon is that uh, um, mechanism that we use in Fitch to assert that in fact a sentence is a logical consequence of another or other sentences. So we check that and we get a check mark. The reason why sentence three is a is an focon as well as an anacon is because of the identity symbol. It's part of the first order language that we're using. Okay, here we are with the second example that I showed you just a little bit ago. It is another case of an argument whose conclusion is not a tautological consequence of the premises, but that doesn't mean that the argument isn't valid, right? We know from the meanings of the predicate larger and the arrangement of the individual constants that if A is larger than B and B is larger than C, it must be the case that A is larger than C. Of course, if we uh, cite lines one and two and claim that three is a tautological consequence of one and two, we'll get an X. That's not the case, however, if we say that the third sentence is an analytical or logical consequence of the first two. We get a check mark. What do you think about FOCON? Is it the case, based on what we've discussed, that sentence three is a first order consequence of one and two? No. Why? Well, the short story here is that we're not in the language of first order logic. In other words, FOCON pays attention to the identity symbol and it also pays attention to the logical connectives that we've been studying in Boolean logic. When we get to chapters involving quantifiers, we'll see that uh, Anna, or sorry, FOCON uh, pays attention to quantifiers in addition to the items that I just mentioned. Now I'm just going to uh, gloss over the last couple of items here, not because they're not important, but because you uh, are already familiar with 
what it means to say that sentences are truth functionally equivalent, that is, that they're truth table equivalent. So when we're talking about pushing negation around and negation normal form, we're talking about ways, additional ways that you can think of truth functional equivalence. So take a moment to look at this slide before moving on. Here are some other equivalences. Now, depending on the version of logic that you study, you'll actually use these and more equivalences as rules in a derivation. In our version of the system, we will sometimes be allowed to uh, use these equivalences uh, by way of taught con in a proof, but more often than not, we're asked to demonstrate the validity of the, the equivalences. In other words, we're asked to demonstrate that, I shouldn't say validity of the equivalences, we're at, actually asked to demonstrate by way of a proof that these sentences are equivalent. Take a look at this slide as well, which gives us uh, some more ideas about equivalence in terms, uh, this time, of the distribution of the conjunction and the disjunction. I, I've given you some ordinary language examples of each. When you're ready, move on. I hope you found this brief, well, not very brief, but still uh, summary tutorial helpful as you make your way through Chapter 4. I have additional tutorials for most of these sections so that you don't have to go through the entire video again in order to hone in on, for example, tautologies and uh, logical truth, um, as well as logical and tautological consequence.